I never quite enjoyed Super Mario Maker 2 as much as I enjoyed the original game. And that's kind of weird, because I really, really do like Super Mario Maker 2. It makes tons of incredible improvements while featuring basically all the content of the original game. It's as flawless as a sequel can get. Yet I just never clicked with it in the same way that I clicked with the first game. So recently I sat down and tried to scribble down all my little thoughtlings about the game, trying to figure out what it was that made me enjoy the original game so much more. And after a couple of hours of intensive scribbling, I took a look back at all of my scribblings. And as it turns out, I had scribbled several pages exclusively complaining about the user interface, which you know, which suddenly made me thinky think. Oh, maybe the UI is the problem. And boy, problems there are. So in this video, we're going to take a deep dive into all the different problems of Super Mario Maker 2's user interface. And we will discuss why I believe that the UI is by far the biggest problem of the second Super Mario Maker. So are you ready? Let's do this. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd love to introduce someone to all of you. This here is Edo, the sad eyedropper tool. Edo didn't make it into Super Mario Maker 2. But the reason why Edo didn't make it into Super Mario Maker 2 is a tragic story of dumb decisions, catastrophic priorities and horrible button layouts. It is the story of why Super Mario Maker 2's UI ended up being so messy. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. The sad eyedropper tool's story starts in 2015 in Super Mario Maker 1. So here's a question for all of you questionable folks. Why do the shoulder buttons on the Wii U gamepad have the exact same function on the left side as on the right side? You know, the upper shoulder buttons are mark something and the lower shoulder buttons are copy something on the right side of the Wii U gamepad and on the left side. Why did Nintendo decide to map the exact same function to several buttons? Because at first glance it appears pretty silly not to use those buttons. But that is only at first glance, because if we glance a second time, then we can see that the buttons on the right side are actually completely useless. Here's the thing, we can't use the buttons on the right side while playing Super Mario Maker, because Super Mario Maker is permanently played with a touch stylus. The game expects us to permanently use touch controls when creating a level. We simply don't have our right hand on a controller while building a stage, because we're holding the stylus with it. Mapping anything onto those buttons doesn't make much sense, because our hand isn't on those buttons anyway. They have to design everything around us permanently using touch controls instead. Take the item pick menu for example. The reason they designed this menu as a simple list is probably simply because picking an item from a list is one of the fastest ways to access something when using touch controls. From the menus to the button layouts, everything is designed around touch controls. And as far as I am concerned, that makes perfect sense. But here is where this hopefully gets interesting. Because in Super Mario Maker 2, the UI is designed around completely different principles. And this is where tragic story of Edo the eyedropper tool becomes so much tragic. Let's take a look at how they designed the item pick menu in Mario Maker 2. Here we pick our items by navigating several radial menus instead of picking them from a list. Radial menus are a pretty inefficient way to access stuff when using touch controls. The original Mario Maker managed to show us over 60 different options to choose from in a single menu that we can open with the click of a single button. But Mario Maker 2 only shows us a fraction of those options once we open the menu. Suddenly there are 5 different menus to choose enemies from each one only showing us 7 options. Suddenly, there are 12 different sub-menus that we have to navigate just to find a single item that we want to use. Suddenly, we can't even see all the gizmos at once anymore. When using touch controls, those radial menus are simply worse to interact with compared to the list menu used in the original Mario Maker. So the big question is now, why would Nintendo switch over to radial menus? Well, that is 
very likely because radial menus are fantastic when using a joystick. Navigating in list using a joystick is a horrible experience, but it works perfectly fine when navigating a radial menu. Hooray! So why do we bring all of this up? And what has all of this to do with our non-existing eyedropper tool? Well, the thing is, in Super Mario Maker 1, they designed the menus around touch controls. But in Super Mario Maker 2, they designed the game around mainly joystick controls with touch controls to support level creation. And thus, the menus in Super Mario Maker 2 are designed around a joystick. Except that they aren't. And this is where Edo's story finally reaches its tragic conclusion. Because if Mario Maker 2 actually were designed to be mainly used with joystick controls, then there is absolutely, totally no reason not to use the right shoulder buttons. You know, if Mario Maker 2 expects us to actually have our hands on the shoulder buttons, then it would be a really good idea if the game actually used those buttons. But the game doesn't. To make matters even worse, they actually opted for a worse system than they had in Mario Maker 1. The copy and the mark function now share a single button. We have to cycle through three different states to actually get to the function that we want to use. Just think about this for a second. We have two buttons that both feature the exact same function, namely to cycle through different states in order to access two different functions. Like, you know, why not put copy onto the one shoulder button and drag onto the other one? They already expect us to use the joystick controls most of the time anyway, because otherwise the item pick menu design would make absolutely no sense whatsoever. If they were to split the two functions onto the two different buttons, then we would even end up with another shoulder button that has no dedicated function yet. I wonder what function we could assign to that button. What function does the game really lack that would really enhance the creation experience? That button could have been an eyedropper tool, which leads us to the first huge problem of Mario Maker 2's UI. Parts of it are designed around a joystick, while others are designed around touch controls, which leads to, well, it leads to a bit of a mess, doesn't it? If we want to put down a note block that contains a sideways spring in Super Mario Maker 2, then we first touch the search icon. Next, we use the shoulder buttons to cycle to the note block and use joystick inputs to select it and press A to confirm. Then we likely switch back to touch controls in order to place the note block where we want to have it. Next, we touch the search icon again and then switch back to using joystick controls in order to cycle to the radial menu that contains the spring and select it, and then switch back to touch controls in order to place the spring down. Next, we tap it for a while until a sub menu pops up that allows us to manipulate the spring state and we choose the sideways spring mode before we finally drag the spring into the note block and hooray we actually did it. Here's how we do it in Super Mario Maker 1. We open the menu, pick the note block, place it, open the menu, pick the spring, shake it and put it into the note block. Who actually ray? Super Mario Maker 2 just never really decided if it wants to be controlled mainly with the joystick or with touch controls. And this results in a user interface that is never optimal to use. But that's only the first part of all the problems. Because there is another, even bigger layer of UI disastrousness going on. The right joystick doesn't fulfill a function in Super Mario Maker 2. The right joystick simply does the exact same thing as the left one. It manipulates the position of the cursor in the room. So here's a rhetorical question. Why? Well, I'm glad I'm asking because I believe the reason is because Nintendo tried to design the UI in a way that makes it possible to map every feature of it onto a single Joy-Con. A single Joy-Con only has one joystick two shoulder and four face buttons, which means that all they had to work with when designing the entire UI were those six buttons and a single joystick. Which leads us to our next little rhetorical question. Because why would they want to have all features of the game be accessible on only a single Joy-Con? Well, and this is where we are entering conspiracy theory terrain, but I believe the reason why they designed everything to be accessible with only a single Joy-Con is because of the two-player building mode. It is possible to build stages together with someone else by sharing a Joy-Con. And for this to work, all options have to be accessible on a single joystick. So assuming my little conspiracy theory is correct, this leads us to our third and final rhetorical question. Because why would they prioritize the two-player mode user interface over the single-player experience? 
Don't look at me like that. I have no idea either. About 99% of total creation time is spent in a single player mode. And a single player mode could really use this right joystick. There is currently no way to change the camera position in the room other than using the cursor. But often there are situations where we want to change our view in the room without changing the cursor position. Like for example, um, whenever we want to look at another area of the level, just scrolling around would be a perfect feature for the currently completely useless second joystick. Yet the right joystick fulfills no unique function in the game. It is so weird to have a completely unused joystick on the one hand, while there are very obvious useful features that could be mapped to it on the other. So here comes a bold claim. But I honestly believe that I have thought more about Super Mario Maker 2's right joystick mapping than most people have in their life. So please consider me to be an expert on this issue. And after long hours of studying and meditating over the joystick functions, the only reason that I can think of why Nintendo would ever decide not to use the right joystick is truly because they wanted to have identical controls for the multiplayer mode. Assuming I'm right about this, then they had just the completely wrong priorities when designing the UI. But it's not just the unused buttons that are like that. There are so many strange decisions like that in the game. Just as an example, take the top left area of the screen. This area is really important because it is the only area which we can comfortably reach with our left thumb while playing the game. Our left hand is the one that always holds the switch, no matter if we use touch controls or if we play with buttons. This area of the screen is simply the easiest for us to reach. So the most important touch features should logically go there. Maybe place the undo dog button here or the delete mode or maybe the search icon, you know, the stuff that we want to access often and quickly. So what did Nintendo end up putting into the most accessible area of the touch screen? Yep, it's the sound effect menu, the game style change menus, and the auto scroller settings. The most useless buttons in the entire game are placed in the most accessible area of the screen. Meanwhile, the undo dog lives a sad and lonely hermit life at the most inaccessible area of the screen. And that's just the beginning of a series of really strange decisions. Because not only did they place some of the least important features into the most accessible area, they also decided to have all of them on screen all the time. But why are those features displayed all the time to begin with? Stuff like the game style that we want to use or clear conditions we want to set, whether the stage is an auto scroller or changing the timer are all options that we really only need to access once or twice per stage, it would absolutely make sense to put those into a level settings submenu. But as it is now, about a ninth of the screen is occupied to display functions that we need once per hour of playing at best and never at worst. To make matters even worse, those menus are completely in the way whenever we want to play something at the edges of the screen. They need a complete button that does nothing else but hide the menu simply so that we are able to place down blocks at the side of the screen, which directly leads us to the next really strange problem. Why can't we just scroll over the edges of a level? You know, why is there a magical barrier at the side of the stage that we can't cross? Why isn't it simply possible to scroll over the edges a bit so that the menu is never in the way. There are so many things implemented in strange ways or missing for no apparent reason. Why is there no fill in or a draw a straight line tool? Why can't we place blocks anymore once we are at the furthest zoom level? The feature select menu for the items is great, but why isn't it possible to quickly shake items to change their state anymore as well? There are just so many strange little problems with the whole way the UI is designed. There are tons of features that would be great to have quick access to while we have unused buttons. Buttons. There are buttons dedicated to hiding the menu, while the menu takes way too much space to show us things that we rarely want to access. There are design decisions that were likely made so that creation in the multiplayer mode has access to every feature, while there are missing features in the single player mode. There are just so many strange problems, some because of wrong priorities, some because they didn't question if copying Mario Maker 1's layout actually made sense, and some just for no visible reason at all. All those strange little kinks of the UI add up over time and make using the interface this tiny bit more cumbersome with every action. But this is still not the final problem of the UI because there is this one final thing that is hurting the creation experience the most.
When Super Mario Maker 2 released, the 3D World style was generally considered to be pretty useless by most folks, including myself, for the very simple reason that the 3D World style doesn't have easy access to shell electricity. For anyone not familiar with the concept of shell electricity, shell electricity is how we transfer signals and information in Mario Maker most of the time. Traveling shells are by far the best carrier of information in Mario Maker, simply because they travel on their own, which, you know, is really important when we want to send information, but also because they are able to activate most items in Mario Maker, be it flipping two state blocks, releasing the content of a question block, or destroying a brick block traveling shells simply get the job done. They are great and really simple to set up. In Mario Maker 1, we simply had to stack a spring and a shell, and in Mario Maker 2, we only need to build a tiny mechanism. And whee! Here we go. In the 3D world style, however, there is no easy way to gain access to shell electricity, because in the 3D world style, we simply cannot place down a single shell. There are traveling shells in this game style, but we can't access them in the editor. So here's the multi-million coin question. Why would they do this? Why would Nintendo decide that we aren't allowed to place down shells like this totally real one? Well, let me show you what I believe to be the reason why we aren't allowed to place down shells in the 3D world style. It's because shell mats aren't part of 3D World. The effect looks even worse than I imagined it would, doesn't it? I believe Nintendo decided not to allow us to place down shells in 3D World simply because the shell mat item isn't part of this game style. They didn't want to have an item that works as a power-up in one style to only be a gizmo-like item in the other one. They tried to keep the game simple and the result is that the game got ridiculously unnecessarily complicated because of it. Because here's the plot twist. We actually do have access to shell electricity in the 3D world style. If we place down a block and put a spiny below it, have a sideways spring somewhere in the area and blow up a bob omp as soon as everything gets loaded, then well then, hooray! Would you believe it? It's shell electricity in the 3D world style. It is absolutely possible to get traveling shells in this game style. It is just incredibly over the top, unnecessarily complicated. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is kind of a running theme with a lot of things in Super Mario Maker 2. There are so many things that should be really simple to achieve that often actually were really simple to achieve in the original Mario Maker that now are unnecessarily complex in the sequel. Things like no longer being able to stack a shell and a spring onto a single tile, or the fact that they removed the ability of shells to carry items. Stuff like making the spawn prevention rules more strict when hitting an old block, or the behavior of semi-solid platforms in the 3D world style. All of those things are tiny annoyances, or simple small changes from the original game that all were meant to make the game more simple. Yet in practice, they end up forcing us to build far more complex contraptions to achieve things that should be simple. All of those things are just small problems on their own, but that's exactly the problem. There are simply too many tiny annoyances in Super Mario Maker 2's UI and its level creation tools. All of them just make each step of the level creation this tiny bit more cumbersome, just so that it doesn't go unmentioned. There are dozens of things that Nintendo drastically improved with Super Mario Maker 2. Stuff like all the amazing new items or the scroll stop are fantastic additions. But you know, for every step forward, Nintendo also took two steps backwards, which, which might as well be their new company slogan now that I come to think about it. Super Mario Maker 2 is a worthy sequel to Mario Maker 1. The game is a straight up improvement over pretty much every aspect. Playing stages online is much more fun. Exploring amazing worlds built by other creators is a beautiful experience. The game features an insane amount of great new items, much more graphical variation and it offers much more depth than the original Super Mario Maker ever did. It is a perfect sequel with one gigantic flaw. At least how I see it, it is a fantastic game that completely messes up the user interface and the user experience. The whole UI never really decides if it is built around joystick or around touch controls. Tons of decisions were made favoring minor things over really important features, and a lot of important features that should be really simple to do are ridiculously complicated to achieve. Everything just feels this tiny bit more complicated and cumbersome to achieve than it should be. I believe this is the reason 
why I never quite clicked with the second game the same way I did with the first one. It is simply because using the creation tools is unnecessarily complicated and unintuitive in Mario Maker 2. I find it really baffling that Nintendo stumbled over this aspect of the game, because usually they are really great with this kind of stuff. At some point, in the very distant future, Nintendo will probably craft Super Mario Maker 3. My by far biggest wish for this hypothetical game is simply that Nintendo manages to make the level creation process in that game as straightforward as it was in the original. Because holy fuzzy would I love it to toy around with all the amazing features of Mario Maker 2 using an UI as flawless as the one of the original game. So here we have it. Why the level creation UI is, in my humble opinion, the biggest problem of Super Mario Maker 2. I hope you enjoyed this little video. If you did, don't forget to leave me your thumb. And maybe you feel especially like interacting with the user interface today and want to hit the subscribe button as well. I hope that all of you have a wonderful day and to see you soon. Goodbye!